Introduction to Equilibrium Systems. So we're going to call this equilibrium, but what we really mean to be saying is that it is a dynamic equilibrium. It looks like nothing is changing, but the reaction is still proceeding. But since the forward reaction and the reverse reaction are happening at the same rate, it looks like nothing's happening. That is what equilibrium is. So when you have some reactants, they can go to make a product. And if the system doesn't establish equilibrium, that's, that's all you need to worry about. However, in some cases, if equilibrium is established, those products that are produced can turn back into the reactants. So at some point, assuming the conditions are correct, the rate of that forward reaction and the rate of the reverse reaction is going to equalize. Um, and we saw these on our concentration time graphs where you have the concentration over time, or uh, concentration and time. And so the reactants would decrease. And so the slope would initially be quite steep. The rate of the reaction, which is the slope of a concentration time graph, the rate was quite steep initially, and then it would plateau out. Um, that plateau, when it has reached horizontal, that means that the rate has stabilized, um, and essentially the, the, the slope is now zero. That is equilibrium. Now, assuming the system can come to equilibrium, what it's saying is the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. It looks like there's no reaction happening. The, the rate looks like it's zero, but that's sort of a net, res, a net uh, sum of the reverse reactions rate and the forward reactions rate being the same. When this is the case, if you were to look at a system at equilibrium, you would see no macroscopic changes. There's no visible changes to the system itself. Three types that we're going to sort of break it up into. The first one is solubility equilibrium. We can spend uh, a whole lesson just on this alone, where you're talking about a solid dissolving into its aqueous form. And when a solution has reached its solubility equilibrium, or if you'd look at something like rock candy here, it's sitting there as a solid, and then you have this aqueous rock candy, uh, basically sugar dissolved in the water. And when you're forming rock candy, the aqueous stuff is depositing itself and crystallizing out of solution. After sitting there for like a week or so, this rate of reaction is going to be, uh, it's going to look like nothing's happening because the de deposition or the crystallization of that aqueous sugar is going to be equal to the amount of sugar that is dissolving into the solution. And it's not that it has stopped, it is still happening. The sugar is still crystallizing onto the solid part and the solid is is going to be dissolving back into the water since those rates are going to be equal at equilibrium at the point of equilibrium then you won't see any macroscopic changes happening so in a saturated solution that's the equilibrium point when the solution has become saturated with these ions there are still going to be things if it's ionic ions if not molecules uh, there are still going to be the solute dissolving into the solution but there are also solute particles crystallizing out of solution at the same rate. And so that is what we call saturation. If it's unsaturated, then more of the solid can dissolve out. And so that rate will be greater. If it is super saturated, like what we do with rock candy in order to get to crystallize out, if it's super saturated, those solute particles are going to be crystallizing out of solution faster than they are dissolving into it. And so we can have a unsaturated solution that could dissolve more crystals out uh or sorry into the solution um you could have a super saturated solution like with rock candy where you have the actual extra particles being dissolved into the solution and they're going to crystallize out into the solid rock candy stuff um and then at some point though either one of those are going to reach a state of equilibrium where the solution is saturated um you have maybe some amount of crystal or maybe stop right before you can actually see the crystal but the solution itself is is uh, saturated with whatever the solute is and the rate at which it is crystallizing and dissolving are going to be equal even if you don't see a giant crystal like in the form of rock candy those ions could still be grouping up in really really small uh, groups and then dissolving again at the same rate that's our saturated that is our equilibrium phase equilibrium think of this as going from a liquid to a gas or a solid to liquid um, or even a gas dissolving um, so when a system is at equilibrium here this process is happening but it looks like it is not happening you don't see any macroscopic changes with a equilibrium system you'd have to close it in order to get this happen for example um, you could have water evaporating out of the liquid into the gas state um, and so it is going from a liquid to a gas 
But if it is a closed system and if the system is at equilibrium, the rate at which the liquid is becoming the gas is equal to the rate at which the gas is becoming the liquid. So it's not that the water is not evaporating. It is. It's just that it's condensing at the same rate. So you see no overall change happening. Also is going to happen with other things like, uh, say, dissolved carbon dioxide. Keep the lid on and it's not stopping the carbon dioxide from coming out of solution but it is allowing the carbon dioxide to go back into the solution at the same rate, so the pop doesn't go flat. If you had ice water at zero degrees, it's not that the ice isn't melting, it's just that it is melting and freezing at the same rate. It's at a state of equilibrium, and so you don't see any macroscopic changes. Chemical equilibrium, obviously something we're gonna be spending a lot of time on. Um, this is when you have your reactants forming your products, but the products are able to go back and form your reactants at the same rate. And again, we saw these on our concentration time graphs. This is where the rate of the reaction would plateau. And it looks like the reaction has stopped. Um, and macroscopically, that's exactly what it would look like. But the reactants are still becoming the products. But since the products are also becoming the reactants at the same rate, you don't see any overall changes. Um, if you want to establish this equilibrium, it has to be um, not just theoretically possible, um, but it has to be plausible based on the conditions as well. And so you, you need to have the right system set up um, and then you can actually have equilibrium established. If you looked at this particular example here, um, we have these reactants and they're becoming products in like maybe uh, previous courses, we, we were doing stoichiometry or something like that, we may have assumed that it was a 100% yield. We were shifting all of the reactants to the products but in an equilibrium system, some of those products are going to go back and form the reactants. That's equilibrium. It has to be reversible. It has to be in a closed system. Um, and then you can actually get this state of equilibrium occurring. The concentration of the reactants, as we saw, again, initially fast, it is going to decrease during the reaction. Um, I think I said reactants there. The concentration of the product would initially start out as zero, and then it would initially have a steep rate of reaction. But eventually, again, all of these concentration time graphs are going to plateau. That is where we see equilibrium. And the system will stay at equilibrium until we do something about it. This is assuming we have a closed system. The concentration of the reactants and the product will remain constant. Equilibrium is achieved, but don't forget this is a dynamic equilibrium. The reactions are still happening, but we just don't see any net change. To get equilibrium to happen, we have to have a plausibly reversible reaction. So though the combustion of glucose is just uh, photosynthesis in reverse, theoretically, if you burnt some glucose with some oxygen, you would get a bunch of carbon dioxide and water. If you put it in a closed system like a jar and you left it for a gazillion million years, you may possibly get another molecule of glucose back out of that. It's, it's, plausibly, re it's possibly reversible, um, but very not plausibly reversible. So not only does the system, the reaction have to be able to be reversed, it has to be likely to be reversed. The more complex the particles are to be formed, the less likely that is going to happen. And there's a whole discussion on entropy that we can get into about that. It must be a closed system. So we want a easily reversible system um, and it has to be closed so that we're not losing the energy and so that that energy can theoretically go back and form those reactants. Theoretically, the universe itself is a closed system, but again, we want to do this within a plausible amount of time. Macroscopic changes then based on this would be not changing. So if you were to measure the pH of this uh, particular system, whatever amount of reactants or products it was causing it to have that pH will stay the same, though the, the reactants are still becoming the products because the products are becoming the reactants at the same rate then any of the observable characteristics of that system will be constant. We can keep track of the information for a equilibrium calculation where we have a bunch of concentrations that we want to track over a series of time using what's known as an ice table. And that is essentially just a, uh, those are the rows of the table that we're going to be keeping track of. It is going to look at the initial concentration of whatever substances or all the species in the reaction, the way in which they are changing or the amount in which they are changing, and um, their equilibrium concentration. So I is the initial concentrations, C is the change, and this is the important one. That's where the mole ratios are going to be applied. Equilibrium concentration is going to be what they end up being at equilibrium. And it's not that they couldn't be something different, um, but under certain conditions, a system will have certain equilibrium values for those concentrations. 
And again, the initial concentration, they, they don't have to be in perfect stoichiometric amounts, so they don't have to follow the mole ratios. But importantly, the manner in which they change is dictated by the chemical reactions coefficients, and so the change row will always be dictated by those molar ratios. That's how if you have any number within the change row, you can use it to find any other number because it's merely just mole ratios to do that. And then putting it all together, you could probably solve for the equilibrium concentrations. Um, we're going to only ever put moles per liter into ice tables, and so when I'm using them, um, knowing that I'm going to be not writing the units, though most other numbers within chemistry, you want to make sure you do include the units with it. With this one, when we're working within these ice tables, um, as long as we know that we're always dealing with moles per liter, then we will just skip writing the units in that case. Hopefully not a terrible decision. All right, so imagine we had a system like so, hydrogen gas and fluorine gas forming hydrogen fluoride gas. Um, we've got three species here. Put it in a closed system. This can quite easily establish an equilibrium. So given that we start with two moles of hydrogen gas and one mole of fluorine gas, those are the initial concentrations. And this particular question is asking for find the equilibrium concentrations of the hydrogen and the hydrogen fluoride. Um, it is also giving an equilibrium concentration. So you can see right off the bat, lots of different things here. There's only three species in this reaction. There's already a bunch of numbers. Um, plus there are three points in time that we're talking about, what it started at, what it changed by, and then what it ended up at for equilibrium. So with that data, we want to make sure we can keep track of it. And that is the point of the ice table to do that and make sure we don't miss anything within our calculations. And we can actually do that within the ice table too. So the ice table basically turns each species in the reaction into a column, and then we have our three rows, our initial, our change, and our equilibrium value. And so this particular one, uh, what do we say, 2.00 moles of hydrogen, 1.00 moles of fluorine, and it didn't say anything about the concentration of the product. So based on the context of the question, we have something that we're starting with. So we would assume, unless otherwise told, that the concentration of the product is zero doesn't have to be zero, but unless stated, the reaction would be such that you'd say, okay, if I'm saying this is a reactant, that means I'm starting with these things, and therefore I probably don't yet have the product. But you could have some product, and then you'd put the value in for whatever it was. Um, it also mentioned that the fluorine gas's equilibrium concentration was 0 0.24, and remember these are all moles per liter. As long as we only ever write moles per liter in ice table, then we can just skip writing them. Um, and so you kind of see how this is going to work is that we have some initial concentrations, we have our final concentration. And so essentially we can see, okay, well, this starts at one and it goes to 0.4. Um, it must be going down by the difference there. And so we have 0 0.76 that it is going down by. Um, and Again, if there's no products, the reaction has to progress in some amount towards those products. There's no way initially it can go back and reform the reactants. That can't happen because there are no products to do that. So we know for sure initially we're going to have a shift to the right, we'll call that, that we're going to form some products, uh, and then we'll have our equilibrium concentration. So if one is going down by 0.76, we know that this is a one to one mole ratio. So this other reactant must also be going down by 0.76. All right. And then we have our... Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, then we have our uh, so one to one to two ratio. So this we knew formed point or went down by 0.76. This one here we know it's a product. It's going up by twice the amount that the reactants are going down, just because of the one to one to two ratio. And so we have this one going down by twice the amount that or sorry going up by twice the amount that the reactants are going down. Follow the mole ratio, and the mole ratio applies to the change rule. Only. It may coincidentally apply to the initial or the equilibrium, but it is definitely going to apply to the change row. If you start at zero and you go up by 1.52, then you would end with 1.52. And our uh, hydrogen gas started at two and went down by 0.76. So we're going to end with 1.24 moles per liter. And we've got our equilibrium concentrations. You write a nice therefore statement and put the units in. Everything's good. 
Try it out once more. Um, here we have ammonia decomposes into nitrogen gas. So we have, again, our species. Uh, we have three species. We have our decomposition of ammonia producing hydrogen and nitrogen gas. Um, be sure that, again, we want to put it, our numbers in moles per liter because this is two liters. If we have four moles in two liters, then obviously we have two liters of ammonia. And it is going to end with two moles, but again, that's per two liters. So that is one mole per liter um, of the ammonia at equilibrium. So let's put that into our ice table. Here's our ammonia, and we said two moles per liter. Again, it didn't say anything about the product, so we can only assume that their initial concentrations are zero. It did give our equilibrium concentration of ammonia at one mole per liter. So clearly, the change then between the two and the one Ammonia is going down by one mole per liter, and we have our mole ratio here of two to one. So this must be going down, sorry, up because it's producing, it's shifting because again, there's, there's no products initially, and so we're going to have to produce some products before we can get to equilibrium. This is a two to one ratio, and so if this ammonia is going down by one, then this one must be going up by half of that. And then we have a 2 to 1 to 3 ratio. And so this one must be going up by 1.5 moles um, for the hydrogen gas, three times the amount of the nitrogen production. Um, and then we have our um, 2 to 3 ratio of the ammonia to the hydrogen gas. If nitrogen starts at 0 and goes up by 0.5, then it must end at 0.5. If hydrogen starts at 0 and goes up by 1.5, it must end at 1.5. And then again, we have our equilibrium concentrations, and we could put that into a nice therefore statement, label them all, put the units on it, everyone's happy. Some misconceptions about equilibrium. First off is that um, make sure at equilibrium, we don't see any changes. So if you can see that something is either melting or freezing, that is not at equilibrium. What is true for a system of equilibrium would be that nothing is changing. So a snowflake that is growing or a snowflake that is melting, that is not at equilibrium. A snowflake flake that is just sitting there at zero degrees Celsius, um, it may be sublimating a little bit, but for every amount it sublimates it, it deposits some more on there. And so whatever changes you have, or let's say melting and freezing, it is equal in both directions. That could be equilibrium. It is dynamic, but it is still at equilibrium. The big misconception is that at equilibrium, the reactants and the products are equal to each other. It's not that that's not impossible, but remember a range of values um, for the amount of product versus the amount of reactant, a ratio that we'll talk about later. Um, but that range of values essentially is any positive number that could exist. Um, so we go essentially from having um, no products being produced almost, and like imagine just having your reactants maybe make one particle of product and then reach equilibrium right away. Um, and so it doesn't have to be equal to the amount of reactants or the amount of products. You could have um, like a whole bunch of products being produced. You, you could have them somewhere near the middle where they're kind of equal, or you could have a whole bunch of reactants left over and not very many products produced. It's anywhere in that range. Well, all that we're saying for equilibrium is that the rate in which they are changing into each other is equal. It doesn't say anything about how much of the reactants you have versus how much of the products you have. There's something else that says that. Percent reaction is a good thing to be able to do with um, the equilibrium values. It's sort of a, a way of comparing, okay, if this did not establish equilibrium, if it did go to completion, if we did get all of the products produced, um, how much would we make? And then we can compare that to what it would be at equilibrium. And so your your actual yield is sort of like what actually happened. Um, if it's establishing equilibrium, then you're not going to get all of your products being produced. But what you could do is compare that to your theoretical yield. And because we're humans, we like to put that into the form of parts per 100. Um, so we normally write this as a percentage. So imagine we had a reaction like so. Um, what would the concentration of the NO2 be if 0.5 moles of N2O4 reacted in a one liter container. So right off the bat, we could figure out what the theoretical yield. So back maybe last grade, we would have looked at um, just doing plain old stoichiometry on this. If we had, again, 0.5 moles per liter of this reactant here, and uh, we turned it all into product, 
It's a one to two ratio, so that would be one mole per liter of product being made. So that is our theoretical, if our reaction did not establish equilibrium, if instead it went to complete formation of the products, then we would end up with one mole per liter of the product. If it's reversible, the, if it establishes equilibrium, if it's in a closed system, this is might not happen if it's if it's an easily reversible system. Um, so imagine it doesn't happen, it doesn't go to completion. Instead, it establishes equilibrium. So this particular question is saying, okay, what if instead of what you thought you were going to get, instead of your theoretical yield, you only got 1.8 moles of your product? Could you express that as a percentage? Hopefully, the answer is yes. Um, the 0.8 is your actual yield that you got because your system established equilibrium before fully producing products. Our one mole per liter, we were able to do quickly using stoichiometry. That is our theoretical yield. And then, of course, we want to express that as a percentage so that it is easy to think about. That's percent reaction. And again, good way of comparing the theoretical yield of a 100% production of products versus what may have been produced based on the equilibrium concentrations because the system may have actually come to equilibrium.